Hello, my name is Luis Antonio Pichardo, and I am the founder and executive director of DSTL Arts, a nonprofit arts mentorship organization that inspires, teaches, and hires emerging artists from underserved communities. Through the various programs that Distill Arts offers, we give our communities an opportunity to express themselves through their words, through their own personal experiences. And that is one of the main purposes of our Creative Impact series. Our Creative Impact program year 2022-2023 is dedicated to the concept of decent living. A decent living can take on various meanings depending on who you are, what your particular background is socioeconomically and other, but the main purpose of this particular series for our program year is really to explore the ways in which multiple things have impacted our local communities of South LA, East LA, and beyond. To begin with the concept of a decent living, we really have to understand what the social contract is and what it means to be part of the middle class. According to the social contract concept, it's essentially an understanding that certain individual rights are given up for the benefits of being part of a society, basically a member of a community. Some of those membership benefits could include things such as access to potable water, food access and stability. In other words, you know, the ability to get quality drinking water to your homes, to have access to food that is both nutritious and delicious, all within a stable environment where you are not lacking that particular access. Also, it means having a basic shelter. Shelter is one of those things that has really come under focus in the last few years, if not decade, here in Los Angeles specifically. Los Angeles is one of the largest metropolitan areas that experiences chronic homelessness. This chronic homelessness or this, this uh, instability in housing for many people really creates a sense of dread, a sense of lacking, a sense of fear among various community members. Housing is one of those things that, depending on who you are, what your socioeconomic status is, you may either fear losing the home that you have now, or you fear the people who are unhoused. And a lot of that has to do with different ways in which we classify ourselves as a society. There's obviously the lower class, the middle class, and then the upper class. Part of the things that make the social contract a unique concept to our experiences here in the United States specifically is the promise of being middle class, the promise of achieving a certain level of living standards that really the rest of the world is now trying to emulate. What might be defined as middle class is having the ability to own an adequate sized house for your needs. And in some cases, it could also be having a little bit extra, that little extra space that allows you to comfortably live to comfortably occupy a space that, that meets your mental health needs, your physical health needs, and perhaps even your spiritual health needs. Access to adequate health care is also an important part of our social contract, and perhaps even something that when you see yourself as part of the middle class, you may be able to achieve in relation to someone who maybe can't afford proper health care. To be part of the middle class also means for many people the ability to raise and put your kids through college, whether that be at least the uh, beginning four years of any kind of bachelor's program or beyond. But that is generally speaking one of the ideas or, or uh, goals, we should say, that defines being part of the middle class. There is also the goal of being able to retire at a comfortable age. And for many, many decades, that comfortable age was 65 years old. As time has gone on, of course, some of these things that define being part of the middle class has changed. And in some cases, depending on your political leaning, you might even perceive that that dream, that American dream of the middle class is quickly diminishing. 
When we talk about the middle class, it's also important to understand that the middle class, that concept, it is a social construct. It's something that we as a society have created. And one could even argue that middle class is really a misnomer. There are really only two types of classes. There's the working class, the people who must work in exchange for goods, services, and the basic things that we need to adequately live. Then there's, of course, the wealth class. The wealth class is the second class that a person could argue exists within our actual society. The wealth class, meaning the people who are wealthy enough, who essentially control all of the jobs, all of the businesses, all of the means for manufacturing and production. The wealth class are essentially the people who rely on the labor of others in order to enrich themselves. To give some context to what a social contract is and what the middle class has become, we need to understand the more contemporary history of the United States. Beginning from the years 1915 to approximately 1930, it was possible for a person to access a certain level of housing while also being able to, to afford a certain type of lifestyle. However, the majority of Americans during that particular era, the 1915 era to approximately 1930, many were actually renters. There were very few homeowners or landowners. It was approximately a four to one ratio where for every one homeowner, there were four renters. In contrast, by approximately 2004, 69% of families actually owned their homes. In 1915, two years after the federal income tax was enacted, the median income was $687 a year where in 1915, the median income adjusted for inflation and today's economic figures, the median income for an individual was approximately $19,880 a year. In 2020, the median income for a household was $67,521 a year which is actually a decrease of 2.9% from the 2019 median income of $69,560. A progressive decline in the wages of a household has led to people feeling as though the middle class is being lost. The middle class dream or the American dream is no longer attainable. Again, to contrast the changes over time in terms of accessibility for housing and more, the cost of a home in the year 1915 was about $3,200, or adjusted for today's dollars, it would be $92,608. And this is across the entire country. Today, at least in the year 2022, the national median home value, the approximate amount that it would cost for anyone across the country to own a home is $374,000. $900. That is a huge, huge difference. We're talking about a $200,000 difference, a slightly over that, to be able to afford a home that would accommodate your basic needs as we have already discussed. Before 1930, by nearly any standards, the American population was predominantly poor, predominantly low income, predominantly part of the lower class. There are two major events that did change the economy and the concept of our social contract. Those two major events that happened within U.S. history include the Great Depression, which was ultimately responsible for the creation of things like social security, the welfare system as we know it today, and also for essentially spurring people to action for a more equitable and just society in terms of wealth distribution. Another major thing that occurred in the early part of the 20th century was World War II and the integration of society. Social integration between races began just around the same time as World War II. What didn't really happen though was full integration. It only happened at the military level. World War II and the benefits of the GI Bill, those things that became essential for spurring the growth of the middle class, 
we're ultimately responsible for growth in incomes, the growth in home ownership, and the growth of real estate development in the United States. Thanks to all of the new people joining the workforce and a new sense of worker rights and worker action, unionism became one of those factors that greatly spurred on the growth of the middle class. There were many successes that followed World War II in terms of the labor movement, and the unionization of the workforce greatly affected the personal income of people across the board, whether you were black, white, brown, etc. However, that particular income growth was not universal. The income growth generated through union action really affected predominantly white men. Women, regardless of race, were still generally not, and to this day actually, are still not making the same amount of money as white men. People of color also are not historically making the same amount as white men. Unionism, although it did have many, many great benefits that, that were brought to the workplace during the post-World War II era. And partly because of, of those great benefits, people began to feel like they were given more access, more opportunity to move up in society, no longer being part of the lower class, potentially moving up to the middle class, and even with the ability to move up into the upper class of the socioeconomic scale. However, that was not universal, and that was not exactly the experience of people of color across the board. The civil rights movement itself was one of those attempts to create equity and parity among women and people of color and people of other religions and sexual orientations. The civil rights movement was really one of those things that tried to make up for the lack of equality in the early U.S. history, even up through to the beginning half of the 20th century. The civil rights era, it was from the 1960s through to the 70s. However, politically speaking, there were many changes that occurred once Republicans began taking over the presidency in the late 70s into the 80s. The Reagan era, which is essentially from more or less the early 1980s through to the early 1990s, which would include obviously Ronald Reagan as president and also George Bush. That particular era saw a systematic breaking down of unions and other benefits that were more aimed at protecting workers across the United States. One major event that occurred was the air traffic controllers strike that occurred in 1981. That particular action of unionized workers in the United States led to many, many people within the federal government actually being blacklisted and no longer able to return to work after their failed negotiations. Furthermore, labor laws that were introduced by many Republican congressmen, senators, and, and even the president at the time of the Reagan era. Many of those labor laws also greatly reduced the need for unions to begin advocating for their employees, for their union members across nearly every sector of the United States workforce. At their peak in 1954, 34.8% of all U.S. wage and salary workers belonged to a union. By the end of the 80s and into the 90s, the number of unionized workers was essentially decimated down to perhaps the, the mid-teens of the entire labor force of the United States. Globalization, especially brought on through the 1990s, through even to the 2000s, ultimately did have a very deep impact on the ability for workers to advocate for living wage increases and other benefits that are typically associated with being part of the middle class. In the first half of 2022, especially with the impact of the global pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, many non-unionized sectors of our workforce did begin making strides towards unionizing, including airlines, the retail sectors, and even within the tech industry. Many new movements for unionization across multiple sectors of our workforce 
have really brought back to light the concept of the social contract and its importance to our ability to maintain a stable working government and workforce. That said, with the steady decline of the American middle class, housing has become one of those issues that have really greatly affected many people across the board. It has affected migration into the United States. It has even affected migration from within the United States, meaning many people are leaving states such as California, where it is extremely difficult to find a home, whether you are a renter or a homeowner. And that is pushing many people to leave the state and go to other more affordable areas of the country, regardless of their political leaning, regardless of the workforce and the opportunities for jobs in those areas. Many people find themselves impacted by the loss of a livable wage. And that has led to many people feeling unstable wherever they are, regardless of race, class, or ethnicity. Again, housing is one of those things that really does ultimately describe what a decent living is. It is our hope that our Decent Living Workshop series explores various elements of what a decent living is, but we cannot lose focus as to one of the core tenets of a decent living, which is housing, basic shelter. There are multiple things that impact what it means to have access to a basic shelter. Historically speaking, though, redlining is one of those things that has for decades, if not nearly a century now, very deeply impacted the ability for people to gain access to the middle class. Redlining impacts multi-generational wealth. It impacts the development of communities and the access to things like food, like potable water, and also other things that we need in a more contemporary sense, such as strong mental health, clean air, clean water, breathable air, air that is not toxic. It also comes down to the ability to afford your rent and also have the ability to save money. It is estimated that a third of your income should be dedicated to rent and the remaining two thirds should be dedicated to saving, paying other bills, but for the most part, creating a cushion, an economic cushion that allows you to cover emergency medical expenses and other unforeseen expenses and even the small moments, treating yourself, taking vacations, having the ability to potentially save for college or other family events. There are many other things that are prohibiting affordable housing to be developed. Things such as house flipping, the way in which speculators may come in, purchase a home, do minor repairs, and then flip the house at a higher rate at a higher cost for the people of the community. This clearly impacts the value of homes. It impacts the property taxes that a community may end up paying over the long term. And it also creates a fluctuation of supply and obviously the growing demand that we consistently see across California and especially in Los Angeles. The lack of low-income housing and its multiple causes are also a great reason why we need to discuss the concept of a decent living and the social contract, what it is that we need to change about our social contract in order to have not only equitable access to housing, but also livable wages, access to water and food, access to health care, access to multiple things that create generational wealth and stability across all communities. It's also important to acknowledge the importance of climate change and the way that it impacts communities in multiple sectors, in multiple areas of our life, and what that means and how that translates into a decent living for all of us. As part of our Decent Living series, we will be examining redlining in various ways, including what it means. Redlining, for the context of our workshops here, describes the process by which homeowners were either allowed home loans for improvement and also buyers allowed the opportunity to buy homes in specific communities. Homes that were developed in areas that were classified as green areas or low risk areas were typically made available to white and affluent individuals. Redlined areas were the areas where it was predominantly immigrant, predominantly black, predominantly people of color, 
And those communities were also found to be more of a high risk area for home loans, for other types of home improvement loans, and also for business loans. Redlining itself is the product of government sponsored efforts to create measures for determining housing availability and loan risk. Things that were a product of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal during the 1930s. That same era of the United States history that saw the integration of the military and then the subsequent movements for civil rights. The Homeowners Loan Corporation in the 1930s, specifically between 1935 and 1939, developed what they called the residential security maps. Through that process of evaluating communities, major metropolitan areas were essentially cut up into different neighborhoods. And these neighborhoods were given a classification of red, blue, green, or yellow. Green was considered first grade or the lowest risk in terms of loan execution and loan payback. Blue was considered second grade, also considered a relatively low risk and high return area or community where the banks were probably more comfortable giving out money. Ultimately, green and blue communities, the white dominant communities, were seen as communities that would be the most likely to have a low risk of loan default and would also be low risk in terms of insurance. Communities that were given the third grade or the yellow classification were often seen as communities that were immigrant, however, model minority. A lot of times these were predominantly Asian and Eastern European communities. Communities designated as fourth grade or red, therefore redlined communities, were often communities that were predominantly minority, meaning people of color, immigrant, perhaps not English speaking, and also most of the time black, more than likely communities that were already heavily disinvested in. The disinvestment of red zoned or red lined areas really is still seen today. The fact that communities that were red lined often did not have access to home improvement loans, small business loans, or even home loans to begin with. All of those things created an environment where businesses were not allowed to flourish, homes were ultimately falling apart, and areas that became more industrialized, more industry oriented. To see the legacy and impact of redlining, all you have to do today, especially for those who live in Los Angeles County, is drive through areas of East LA, predominantly Boyle Heights, and also drive through sections of South LA from the city of Vernon to Huntington Park to Bell and Bell Gardens, all the way down through Compton and even Long Beach. You will see that there are many areas along these vast corridors of South LA where you will find more industry, more commercial parks, more areas where pollution essentially leak into the environment of the surrounding communities. If you are fortunate enough to find housing in South LA, especially during the turn of the century or even in the middle of the 20th century, you were more than likely going to find communities where food deserts were vast, where it was much more difficult to find a bank, where even healthcare access was inadequate. Even things such as parks, green spaces, and bike lanes were rarely ever developed in these areas because it was believed that these communities had no infrastructure or desire to even have this type of comfortable living space. A decent living was essentially denied of the communities who were classified as red zone areas. The lack of housing has ultimately created within these communities a strong renter culture, a culture where people are typically not permanent, but it's also done more than that. The lack of home ownership in predominantly Black and Latino communities does lead to the lack of generational wealth. Wealth cannot be built without real estate. And that is one of the things that green and blue communities have very much flourished and therefore perpetuated their economic status. And the same goes for red-lined and yellow-lined areas. 
These areas are disinvested communities where home ownership is so low that most people continue to live in the lower class socioeconomic sector. Redlining also served as a way for effectively systematizing segregation. Economic opportunities were essentially erased from redlined areas due to, again, the lack of investment from outside sources. If you were to overlay a residential security map developed during the 1930s over contemporary maps of even Los Angeles or any other community, you will find that a large majority of Black people and Latino people live in communities that were once redlined. Ironically, these are the same communities that are often fighting against gentrification, a sort of new infusion of funding from outside sources typically from white families, white people who now find themselves in a space where they can afford buying cheaper houses, cheaper businesses. The redevelopment of previously redlined areas is having a very deep impact on the not only mental health and cultural health of communities, but also the economic health of families overall. Redlining was ultimately found to be unconstitutional and was no longer an active practice after the 1960s. However, its impacts are still felt today. So the question is, what can we do about it? What can we do about redlining? What can we do about the failures of our social contract that we once believed to exist between our communities and the larger government? There are many ways to answer that question. I don't have an answer to this that would make all of these things go away immediately. However, what I do offer you as a viewer, as a potential participant in our workshops, is an opportunity to have your voice and your story presented to our political leaders locally who can potentially right these wrongs, who can potentially create opportunities for the communities that we all know and love. To learn more about the publication that we will be developing as part of the Decent Living series, you can visit our website at dstlarts.org slash creative impact. Decent Living, as it is tentatively titled, is going to be an anthology that collects the letters, the poems, the visual art, the photography, whatever it is that you develop in response to the concept of a decent living. Tell us your story. Share with us your ideas for a better future. Share with us your voice so that we may pass that on to the people who are going to listen. For those who submit a work of writing or visual art, you will be able to have your work published for free if selected, and you will also receive a free copy of our Decent Living Anthology that will be produced at the close of this workshop series. Furthermore, copies of the printed anthology will also be sent to our local political leaders so that your voice your stories will be in their hands, and then they will have the opportunity to further understand the legacy of redlining and the need for us to change our social contract. Thank you for following along with this short little video on the social contract, what it means to be part of the middle class, and the legacy of redlining. Again, my name is Luis Antonio Pichardo. I'm the founder and executive director of DSTL Arts. And if you have any questions or would like more information about our Creative Impact series, again, visit our website at dstlarts.org slash creative impact. We look forward to gathering your stories, listening to your voice, and partnering in the sharing of your message with the world. Thank you once again.